Marion, can you hear me? Yes, I'm recording. Okay. Good morning again. Sorry for the stop and start. Um, didn't know I was muted. Again, welcome to the fifth in our series of eight reconstruction classes uh, brought to you by the Minnesota Asala chapter of, uh, of Asala. Um, this is our summer lecture series. Happy 4th of July, as I started to say a moment ago. Happy Independence Day. And at the end today, if I can get through this quickly enough, I hope to give you some segments of Frederick Douglass's What to the Slave is the 4th of July. Next week, if our plans go as, as we hope, Michael B. Moore, the great grandson of uh, Robert Smalls, the uh, Reconstruction era South Carolina congressman and hero of the Civil War, uh, Michael's going to join us for an interview. So, so we're working on getting that um, ironed down and I hope you, you'll enjoy it. But uh, let's get started today. Move my slide here. Okay. The, the imagery that you'll find out of this era, I think, is, is stunning. We've seen some of this in the video clips uh, from our Facing History and Ourselves series. This is perhaps my favorite. These are obviously uh, Black men voting, perhaps for the first time. And to me, there is no better depiction of humanity, in this case, black humanity, perhaps recently out of slavery humanity, these black men voting. You see the gentleman uh, with the hat on his shoulder, his pierced ear, followed by the gentleman with the very snappy hat, followed by probably a member of the U.S. Colored Troops, fresh from the battlefield. This, this captures for me everything that Reconstruction promised, everything that the 4th of July promises and has promised for all these many years. It, it just strikes me uh, so powerfully. I hope it does you as well. But quick summary from last week. We talked quite a bit about the radical Republicans, about Charles Sumner, Thaddeus Stevens. You've heard those names over the last three Saturdays. They're obviously key figures in, in this movement. And um, again, we, we talked about the ideology that they represented, the hopes that they promoted in their, their, their legislative attempts, the battle that they fought against Andrew Johnson in his efforts to uh, stem the tide of the change that, again, Reconstruction presented. We looked at the two terrible events, the New Orleans and the Memphis race riots, reminding ourselves again that the threat to the lives of free and freed Black people was an ever-present one during all times in American history, perhaps no time more so than during this post-Civil War, this era of extreme passion and anger, creation, and hope on the behalf of, again, the freedmen. We'll continue to see events like, unfortunately, uh, when we look at uh, our sixth and seventh weeks in, in the class here. The Civil Rights Bill of 1866, the Reconstruction Acts of 1867, we touched on. We'll, we'll spend more time looking at the three Reconstruction Acts and, and the important role it would play in, again, the efforts of the radical Republicans to try and cement freedom, to try and um, make real for all time. Uh, this, this hope of liberty and justice and equality uh, for the freedmen. And the 14th Amendment, of course, we touched on the um, birthright citizenship, uh, due process, equal protection. We looked at the process and, and we'll, we'll conclude our study of the amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th today. Uh, and I think I've got a very good summary 
uh, in, in one of the short clips that, that we'll show. I love the questions that you all have offered up and Bob and Carol Catno offered one at the end of last week. I've tried to paraphrase it here. So how did Southern historians version of history dominate the narrative? And, and they were really asking me to contrast the, this, this narrative from what we've called the Dunning School and why weren't historians in the North? So from um, universities and academies in the North, why weren't they challenging this? And the narrative, of course, again, is the, the lost cause. Uh, I was so intrigued by the question that uh, I was taken back again to W.E.B. Du Bois's Black Reconstruction in America, uh, reminding us again of the, the incredibly uh, important work that 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 um, that that tech uh, Du Bois hits this squarely as only he can. Uh, he, he criticizes the scholarship, again, having done a review. Remember, Du Bois uh, published Black Reconstruction, I believe, in 1938. Uh, so obviously, it is perhaps the first, maybe the only uh, academic work in the decades after the Civil War that would challenge this narrative. But he criticized the North, Northern uh, academics uh, because, A, they, they didn't rely on primary sources, uh, like the congressional testimony taken by the Reconstruction uh, uh, Republican Congress. Uh, they, they certainly never relied on the, the testimonies and the statements from uh, freed Black people. And they dismissed uh, Stevens and Sumner as, as essentially um, radical Republicans. Again, this would have been after uh, the Democrats had taken control of the South. And, and so Du Bois's first answer to Bob and Carroll's uh, question is that Northern academics just weren't doing good, good scholarship. He reminds us as well, Du Bois does, that the center of this, this lost cause narrative comes out of Columbia University and Johns Hopkins universities. So these are uh, certainly Columbia, a northern school, uh, Johns Hopkins uh, as well. And, and he points to two key players. Uh, we've mentioned uh, William A. Dunning before. That's where the Dunning School uh, get, gets its name. John Burgess was also one of the leaders in this movement. Burgess is a, a Tennessean. Uh, Dunning was from New Jersey. And Burgess was just uh, out and out a racist. Here is a, a statement from uh, some of his writing. Uh, James Burgess says, the claim that there is nothing in the color of the skin from the point of view of political ethics is a great sophism. A black skin means membership in a race of men, which has never of itself succeeded in subjecting passion to reason has never therefore created any civilization of any kind. To put such a race of men in possession of a state government in a system of federal government is to trust them with the development of political and, and legal civilization upon the most important subjects of human life. And to do this in communities with a large white population is simply to establish barbarism in power over civilization. So this is John Burgess, again, one of the founders. And, and, and again, there's this, this group that they surround themselves with. Uh, a large number of students from the South will attend Columbia, Johns Hopkins, and will be taught by Dunning and Burgess. They would go on to produce most of the uh, academic scholarship in the early, late 19th, early 20th century. And, and uh, you know, essentially the, the message was, uh, you know, all of this scholarship, sympathy to the white South, again, the, the wounded South that had been um, so brutally and wrongfully uh, imposed upon by the North, and, and a North that would come to its senses and, and, and senses and realize that, that really uh, the, the South knew best how to deal with its, its Negro problems. 
out of the Dunning and Burgess school will come scholars like Ulrich B. Phillips. His American Negro slavery was the slavery text for uh, most of the early, the, 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 the first four or five decades of the 20th century. Claude Bowers' The Tragic Era and Thomas Dixon's The Klansman, a historical romance of the Ku Klux Klan, which was going to be, would be the basis of D.W. Griffith's Birth of a Nation, are the text, I think Eric Foner has mentioned them in one or two of, of the video clips. This is the product of this same school, ultimately leading again to um, Gone with the Wind as, as the most popular version of, of this mythology. So again, I, I, uh, Bob and Carol's um, question, again, brought me back to um, Du Bois and I'm, and I'm appreciative uh, of them doing that. Also the um, Slate Academy. So, so Jamal Bowie and Rebecca Onion, I've mentioned, I've, I've relied on uh, their Slate Academy podcast on reconstruction. And uh, they have been very helpful in my understanding. They have brought to uh, the, the discussion, great scholars, one of them being Kate Mazur and, and Northwestern University uh, historian. In her podcast with Jamel and Rebecca, she reviews a book called The Prostrate State. So this is South Carolina under Negro government published in 1874. So right in the um, center of the, the 12 to 15 years we, we call Reconstruction. And, and it may have been, again, what Burgess and Dunning and others would look to, and they certainly would. Pike was a northern born anti-slavery abolitionist who traveled in the Reconstruction South reporting for the New York Tribune. He was no friend of the freedmen, uh, despite his, his anti-slavery credentials, which Mazur points out was, was not unusual uh, throughout our study, in fact, of slavery, of the abolition movement. We found many examples of uh, activist anti-slavery abolitionists who were also anti-Black. That you hated slavery does not equal a particular uh, sensitivity or sensibility toward, toward the, the, the enslaved people. So Pike's reporting uh, and his book employed racist stereotypes and characterizations of Black politicians and sympathetic portrayals of white Southerners who were unfairly subjected again to this incompetent, brutal black rule. In exploring this more deeply, and, and this is really relevant to the subject we're gonna to touch on today as we introduce the era of elected black political leaders during reconstruction, um, Bowie and Onion asked Mazur, because there's so much, uh, so many allegations around the, the, the level of corruption during Reconstruction, just how corrupt were these so-called black governments. Um, and she expressed the view, Mazur expressed the view that they weren't any more or less corrupt than others. She made three important points in the discussion that explains sort of the view of people like Dunning and Burgess and these others toward this era we refer to as Reconstruction. A, these elected officials were black and therefore had to be corrupt. How could they not be corrupt, right? B, that they were elected under the Civil War or Reconstruction Amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. And they, these amendments, these statutes were themselves viewed as corrupt. And then lastly, they, the, as we will see, the legislation being promoted by the black elected officials supported education, the buildings of asylums and hospitals, investments in rebuilding an infrastructure destroyed by five years of war. That required investments, that required taxes 
And these sorts of investments were never funded before in the South and, and therefore had to be corrupt. So I, again, I, I've taken some time to answer Bob and Carol's question because I think it is important to everything we understand really about the next phase of Reconstruction, about its successes and about its failures. Two other quick questions. I'm going to leave this and we'll come back to it again. Uh, the question, did the Freedmen's Bureau assist in reuniting formerly enslaved families? And, and if I missed that point in the earlier lecture, uh, my bad. I mean, the, the Freedmen's Bureau agents were, as I've said, uh, vitally important to sustaining life among freedmen. And, and one of the ways they did that most importantly is in reunite, reuniting families, helping people connect with loved ones who had been lost either through the slave trade or been um, uh, sold off by the former enslavers. And, and so they, they played a critically important role in, in again, building this, this black family that would be the black communities. And as far as the registry of names, this, the uh, related question, uh, uh, I think the records that the Freedmen Bureau agents kept and submitted to Washington, which are the sort of primary documents that the boys would have relied on, that historians like Fawner and Blight certainly rely on, would, would document the fact, the, the important role that these uh, free, uh, Bureau agents played. So let me move on. A couple of key events as we move into uh, this sort of mid part of Reconstruction. 1866 midterm elections. The Republicans strengthen their hand. So the, the radical Republican Congress has now heard from the people and the public opinion is in favor of the, the agenda that the radical Republicans have put forward. Andrew Johnson has not gone away. Andrew Johnson uh, is still a threat to what the radical Republicans want to do. Uh, they passed this 1867 Tenure of Office Act as a check on Johnson's power and their expectation that he will start picking off uh, members of his administration who are either radical Republicans themselves or have shown uh, some, some support for that. The Tenure of Office Act would have required Johnson to get congressional consent, or at least uh, uh, he, he could not have simply uh, fired his, his uh, defense secretary, which of course was his target, and they knew that. This would ultimately be the act on which he will be impeached. Uh, many people believe that Johnson was impeached because of his botched handling of Reconstruction and his ongoing battles with the radical Republicans and all of that's true, but it was in fact his firing of Defense Secretary Stanton that would lead to the article's impeachment and he will uh, be tried in the Senate and will um, be saved. It won't go up any further and I can't even get the picture back. All right, so let me, uh, let's see here. The Reconstruction Act of 1867. All right. As we said at the end of last week, uh, the, the, the Reconstruction Acts create military districts, five military districts in the South, and impose upon the South the requirement that the states, the new governments, adopt new constitutions, doing away with the black codes that had been a part of the Johnson era new governments that he created, that uh, freedmen, free and freed black men vote, that the new governments under these Reconstruction Acts would ratify the 14th Amendment, and that, that these were all conditions, precedent to these states being readmitted. Of course, Johnson's going to veto these bills. Um, and, and as for the Reconstruction Bill, his comment in, in a uh, 
addressed to, 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 to uh, the Senate, he says, the Negroes have not asked for the privilege of voting, President Johnson said, and the vast majority of them have no idea what it means. We carried on a four years war to punish the crime of defying a constitution. Says, if we now ourselves defy the constitution, we prove that they were in fact fighting, fighting for Negro equality. So again, this sets the stage for the rest of our discussion today and introduces uh, what we're going to examine over the next two weeks. And that's the um, election of black men in office at the federal, state and local levels. But let's uh, begin that with a video from our Facing Our History and Ourselves series. Black people in the South embraced politics like they had never imagined. And from the earliest Reconstruction election, especially in 1868, hundreds of African American politicians were elected. There's your most visible, obvious revolution of Reconstruction, the black politicians. Black people having experienced non-personhood, knew that they had to create new democratic practices and institutions. Now they had every reason to resent whites. They had every reason to equate whiteness with slavery. They had every reason to maybe want to destroy the land that they worked for nothing. But instead, they thought their blood and sweat, their labor, built something that they now wanted the fruits and benefits of. And so they wanted the South to succeed. They wanted it to be productive. They wanted it to be economically successful. And having asked for rights themselves, they didn't think it would be fair to deny it to other people. And so what they did was they made alliances with poor whites. Reconstruction is the term we use to describe the period after Congress passes the Reconstruction Act of 1867, which sets in motion the creation of new governments throughout the southern states based on what they call manhood suffrage, that is, men voting without any racial qualification. That wasn't the end of Radical Reconstruction in congressional terms. You have the impeachment of Andrew Johnson in 1868, which fails. The Senate comes one vote short of actually removing him from office. You have the 15th Amendment passed by Congress 1869, which prohibits the states from denying the right to vote to anyone because of race. It tries to make black suffrage now national. The Reconstruction Act only applied to the South. Now the border states and the North Black men are supposed to vote throughout the country. And finally, in 1875, you get the final act of radical reconstruction, which was the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which tried to declare illegal racial discrimination in public accommodations.
So radical reconstruction lasts about 10 years up through 1877. And during that period, Congress is continuing to attempt to underpin some notion of equality for the former slaves, now black American citizens. Now, radical reconstruction also refers to what's going on in the South. New governments are created in all the southern states with African-American men voting in large numbers for the first time and holding office for the first time. And these radical governments attempted, with various measures of success, to rebuild the South. The way that African-Americans uh, reimagined themselves uh, as political beings was something that was very important in terms of how Reconstruction manifested itself uh, kind of on the local everyday level in the South. Now, most offices were held by whites. The old view of Reconstruction used to call this the period of black supremacy, which it wasn't. Most major offices were held by whites. But nonetheless, in a country where no black people virtually had held any public office before the Civil War, suddenly you have, by my estimate, about 2,000 maybe black men who held public office ranging from U.S. Senate and Congress down to members of state legislatures, uh, state officials of one kind or another, down to justices of the peace, sheriffs, school board officials, and it was all levels of political society. hear about Reconstruction as a period in which race triumphs the adequate functioning of government because there is such racism among the white population that they are unable to work with African Americans. In fact, that's really not true. In the early years of the political Reconstruction of the South, the late 1860s, the early 1870s, you're going to get in many of the southern states coalitions where African Americans and especially poorer whites work together fine. Many southern whites are okay with voting with African Americans. They're okay with the new state constitutions because one of the things the new state constitutions do in the South is they use state governments to rebuild the shattered states. They rebuild the schools, they rebuild the hospitals, they rebuild orphanages, they put money into railroads. And that was very popular among both black voters but also poor white voters. So there was a moment when African Americans and whites did work together. These reconstruction governments were in large part interracial political experiments. All of these people had never before worked together within the realm of politics, all of whom were coming out of the system of slavery, were now sitting across the aisle from one another and next to one another trying to figure out how do we reconstruct our constitutions? How do we rewrite our state constitutions? How do we pass new laws? How do we guarantee at the state level in southern states, which had denied black people rights of, ex of citizenship, had denied them citizenship all along throughout American history, how do you, how do you, how do you reconstruct a new state, not just a new society, a new nation, but a new state. One particular experiment is the South Carolina Constitutional Convention of 1868. And this was convened, as all the southern states convened them, uh, to rewrite the state constitution. And so what happens in South Carolina, which is quite remarkable, is that a majority black delegation comprised of formerly enslaved people and also free people of color from before the Civil War came together and along with sympathetic whites and other folks who, who got elected to the delegation to rewrite the state constitution. And what comes out of that uh, are a number of incredibly progressive laws and pieces of, of policy. In particular, you see the support for and the enshrinement of universal public education, integrated co-educational public schools that are supported by taxes. Because the delegates, particularly the black delegates at the South Carolina Constitutional Convention, understood that without good schools, without full opportunity to get a great education, the promise of freedom was always going to be constrained, was always going to be hampered. 
if black people could not get the kinds of educations that would then give them access to a better life. Probably the most long-lasting achievement of Radical Reconstruction was the creation of the first public school systems in the South. There had been virtually no public education in the South before the Civil War. These schools were ge almost all racially segregated. In New Orleans, there were integrated schools, but basically most places there weren't. But nonetheless, the establishment of public schools was something that was obviously fundamental and necessary in the South, and that lasted well after the end of Reconstruction. There were also efforts, as I say, to rebuild the southern economy, railroad construction. These states passed the first civil rights laws in American history at the state level, outlawing various kinds of discrimination. And even on a, on a more, I guess, down-to-earth basis, the presence of sympathetic local officials, your police, sheriffs, judges, justice of the peace, the fact that blacks are now serving on juries for the first time, meant that the law just sort of operated in a more egalitarian way. If a black person was accused of a crime, he had a jury with some black people on it. Or if there was a black sheriff, you know, he would try to treat everybody pretty much the same. This was a, a moment in which uh, the, the, the idea uh, of, uh, of white supremacy, you know, was fundamentally challenged. Uh, the world was turned upside down, you know, from the perspective of, of white Southerners. Uh, and uh, that was, uh, that was remarkable. <laughs> Certainly, many white Southerners benefited from the Reconstruction governments, even though they tended to oppose them. But the notion that these are black governments and are mostly favoring blacks, which is a considerable exaggeration, because a lot of what they're doing is trying to rebuild the whole region, becomes more and more of a pol political weapon against Reconstruction. There were other issues as well. It costs money to do all these things. Building a school system out of scratch costs money. Taxes went up. White people own more property than black people. They paid a higher percentage of the taxes. But the basic reason for the opposition was just pure racism. Three or four years after the end of slavery, most white Southerners just found it impossible to accept the idea of blacks exercising genuine political power. They just found that white supremacy was the rallying cry of the opposition to Reconstruction. And by the 1870s, that is undermining white support where it existed for the Reconstruction uh, regimes. Let me emphasize uh, a couple of points I think that are particularly important uh, from this video and then we'll, we'll take some questions. Foner made the point that um, most offices during this era of black political control uh, were held by whites. No more than 2000 black elected officials at, at every level from the governorship the, the U.S. Congress to the sheriff's office in a local town were held by, by black people. This is a part, again, of this myth, the era of black supremacy that will drive this narrative into the lost cause, into Jim Crow, into just this, this wrong reading of history at the time. So really important to emphasize. The second point, both uh, Professor Lipsitz and Heather Cox Richardson talked about the coalitions of poor and white blacks and the um, the opportunities that the the as she said the willingness of poor whites 
to coalesce with poor freedmen because they were doing things that were good for poor people that had never been done it before in the South. I think I made the point early on in our lecture series that there were not public schools in the South antebellum before the war. And, and these poor white folks recognized that schools, hospitals, were, were important to them. Du Bois, perhaps more than any other historians, because he is a Marxist uh, historian, his, his framework, his mindset, certainly later in life, uh, was, uh, did have a Marxist orientation, always considered both class and race. And what frustrated him more than anything else was the, the inability of poor black folks and poor white folks to see the, their commonality of interest and then to challenge capital as it sought to degrade labor. Racism, as, as Foner or Blight said, of course, is, is the, the reason for that inability, but, but uh, it would nevertheless haunt uh, du Bois throughout his life that, that in all of his writing for the NAACP and all of his efforts, he was never able in his work with the labor unions and the labor movements, both black and white, never able to get poor people to see that <laughs> you have more in common with your black brothers than you do with capitalists. Um, the third point out of this video, which I think is, is excellent, uh, Tim McCarthy, I believe, and Ch Clay Williams make the point that freedmen, even before uh, the war, before uh, black people wanted to learn to read and write they were punished for it, some were murdered for it during slavery. That desire to read, that desire to be educated was a fire burning in this people long before this time. Reconstruction obviously offered uh, the best opportunity and I think it was Tim McCarthy's words, they understood the opportunity of an education to the promise of freedom. Uh, so you will you will see and, and to me this picture uh, late night small school in the country you have grandparents and grandchildren in the same one room school house uh, learning learning to read uh, it's just such a powerful image to me always has been uh, uh, so again, I, it's, it's a marvelous video, captures some of what, what I'm trying to convey, but let me be quiet. Uh, let's see, uh, Marian, Linda, Lois, do we have any questions or comments before we move to the next section? Uh, yes, we have a, a question, uh, a comment. Uh, maybe, David, you can speak uh, about the Daughters of the Confederacy rewriting the textbooks used in, in the schools to change the narrative very briefly, and uh, that probably came from, from Linda Crump, who's done more reading in this area than me, and I, I will get a copy of the article she shared with me, but this group and groups like this group are primarily responsible for uh, the, the monuments that, that are of such controversy today. They took this lost cause and drove it through state houses through the US Congress, through school boards, through textbook companies. And, and again, I, I think the, the, the history here, the record here is really clear that this was a very, very influential group uh, that, that um, fed what generations of American school children learned about the Civil War, about slavery, about the eras after slavery. and, and would explain why there is such confusion today in, in, and, and why it's so important that we're doing what we're doing and, and trying to, to, to correct uh, some of what groups like this, um, uh, this, this women's uh, uh, confederates, I don't know the right name, but, but I'll send you that. It's, it's certainly uh, an important read and, and explains a lot about the mythology around the Civil War and aftermath. Anything else, Mary? Yes, another question. Why was it called Jim Crow? Uh, 
Jim Crow was a character, actually a, um, a, a, a white, I think a British entertainer, uh, who blackfaced himself, and this is before the war, so it's, a, it's an image that, um, again, precedes the war, precedes Reconstruction, Jumpin' Jim Crow, and, and he, um, it was a minstrel, it was really the, the, the origins of minstrelsy, and uh, he would go around putting on these performances, and, and that obviously sparked a, a very popular uh, movement of, among uh, actors and, and dancers who would blackface, uh, black their face, and um, um, entertain white audiences and, and propose that they understood, uh, the South understood uh, Southern culture, the relationship with blacks and whites, and, and they would drive this minstrel image of black people for not just America and the North, but really uh, globally uh, for 20, 30 years. Um, Henry Louis Gates in his Stony the Road uh, covers this ground better than, than anyone. Uh, it was the combination of minstrelsy as well as the, the literature, uh, the Uncle Remus uh, tales uh, Joel Chandler Harris. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it's, again, I, I recommended his book before I recommended it again for that reason. Anything else? Before we move uh, on? Two, two more questions. Uh, All right. who, who trained the freedmen to participate in the, in the government, the black freedmen? Um, Union League clubs. I'll give this one good example. There, there are a host of examples. You could point to the, to the, um, um, the, the U.S. color troops uh, who would come into communities, and some of them, many of them uh, were educated and, and, and obviously influenced the, the Freedmen Bureau agents uh, as well. During the, the Reconstruction Acts, uh, during the, the uh, period when the U.S. Uh, soldiers were, um, in fact, registering uh, Freedmen to vote. That was a part of, uh, again, the military control of the South. So there was there was obviously uh, education taking place on on that level. There were um, aid societies. Uh, so people like the AME Church, it, it was not an aid society, but as an example, uh, people from the AME Church and missionary societies were coming from the North into the South providing this kind of education. And then there were other aid societies like the AME Church uh, doing, doing the same. So there were, there were lots of opportunities for education. Um, try, I, I'm trying to think of the name of this uh, one group that sent um, teachers from the North. Um, and and I'll, I'll get that, that name and share it with you, but there were, were um, obviously uh, many opportunities, not enough, but, but there were people engaging with uh, the freed population to, to get them prepared to pr fully participate in, in democracy. One okay. more. One more question. Uh, and then there, there are others, but we'll save them for the next question you. break, okay? okay? Also, uh, there was a reference to a black sheriff. Were there blacks in law enforcement during Reconstruction? Yes, there were. And I'll share, I'll try next week to share uh, again, from the uh, Slate Academy, uh, one of their experiments, uh, again, their, their eight or nine segments are called uh, experiments, and this was the experiment in self-defense. And um, there were militias, there were sheriffs, um, and we'll, we'll cover that ground uh, as carefully as we can next week. Okay? Okay. All right, thanks. Let me just move quickly. Again, I'm, I, I've told you I've become enamored of the, um, the imagery in this era, and this is, this is one of my favorites. I, I was trying to get some background on this, but, but I thought it'd be helpful because it's really hard to read. And if I can make this pointer work, this, this is obviously a diorama, if that's the right term of celebrating the 15th Amendment, which is where our conversation is going now. But let me just walk you through what the legends uh, represent here. In the top, uh, you see uh, Grant, uh, 
to the my far right, you see his vice presidential uh, uh, partner, Colfax. In the very center, you see uh, uh, William Delaney, uh, who was a uh, antebellum uh, abolitionist, uh, a, uh, a U.S. colored troop. Uh, I think he was the highest ranking black officer, um, a, a partner of uh, Frederick Douglass, who you see here in the center, and Hiram Revels, one of the um, black men who would go on to be a senator. So this is the, um, the, the, the sort of the outline. But if I move down um, here, you see the reading of the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, this, this third window uh, is, is entitled, We Unite the Bonds of Fellowship. Uh, three uh, black gentlemen who appear to be part of a fraternal organization. Moving for, uh, further down, uh, window five here is, uh, education will prove the equality of the races. Um, which I believe is, is here, a school schoolroom. Um, six, uh, I, I almost missed Abraham Lincoln here, I'm sorry. This is Lincoln in this window and John Brown in this window. Um, let's see, celebration of the 15th Amendment is number seven. This obviously is the largest part of the array and you see a, a celebration here, a parade. Uh, six, uh, the ballot box, you see a black gentleman voting here. Um, let's see, this is a, um, trying to find the, this is obviously a, a wedding celebration. Uh, it's number six here, it says Liberty Protects Marriage, the Marriage Altar. Uh, number nine here is our representatives sit in the national legislature, again, representing the fact that uh, Blacks are sitting in Congress and, and in other uh, halls of legislation. Uh, Ten, the Holy Ordinance of Religion are free. Uh, 11, uh, freedom unites the family circle, black family around um, perhaps their dinner table. table. Number 12, uh, we will protect our country as it defends our rights. So a, uh, a picture of uh, US colored troops probably uh, during the war. And lastly, we will till our own fields. So I, 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 I'm struck by these. I, I hope you all are there. They're beautiful and, uh, but let me, return my pointer and, and move, move on with our lecture. All right, the 15th Amendment. Um, the election of 1868, uh, after the election of the, the midterms in 1866, the uh, Republicans uh, recognized uh, their newfound power uh, and, and they recognized the need for, while, while black folks in the South had been voting with the assistance, the registration of, of uh, uh, army troops uh, who are positioned in that they, they know they need something more. So they're pushing for a national standard for voting. The Democrats, of course, are, uh, are, are, are scaremongering and warning of, again, this reference to, to Negro supremacy. Uh, the, the Republican, the actual platform for that year left voting to each state, which of course is our practice today. But Grant nearly wins uh, uh, victory. Uh, but, but realize the need uh, for uh, something more in the way to secure uh, both the vote for black men as well as the ongoing control of the government by the Republican Party. So they're confronted with two options, uh, to have a positive national standard, that, that a, a right to vote, in other words, or to have a negative national standard, uh, which would bar discrimination uh, in the exercise of the right to vote. Uh, and, and, and there is an interesting, so February of this year marks the, I believe, 150th anniversary of the passage of the 15th Amendment. In um, honor of that, uh, uh, Jamel Bowie, again, uh, you hear me mention his name um, often, uh, I've become a very big fan of his. He, he did a piece for the New York Times called The Equality That wasn't enough, making the argument that the country should have adopted a national standard. And I uh, just want to give you a couple of passages because he, he describes this, this opportunity that was lost. So the 15th Amendment, as it exists today, uh, reads, the rights of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Section two 
the Congress shall have the power to enforce this article by appropriate legislation. So when we talk about these two options, uh, in Bowie's article, he refers to a, an amendment that was proposed by Henry Wilson of Massachusetts that would have created this sort of positive right to vote standard. Wilson's amendment reads, there shall be no discrimination in any state among the citizens of the United States in the exercise of the elective franchise in any election therein, or in the qualifications of office in any state on account of race, color, nativity, property, education, or religious belief. So it would have been an inclusive standard, as Bowie says, uh, providing, uh, creating a broad right to vote and hold office. That's not what we have today, obviously, and, and would, would be would partly explain uh, why we have uh, such such a, a, a ongoing issue over um, the, the Voting Rights Act uh, preclearance, uh, erasure of the preclearance in the Shelby decision, and and the almost immediate action by our current Republicans in Congress to do everything they can to suppress votes. Uh, Bowie concludes his his piece by um, again highlighting the missed opportunity of our 15th Amendment. He says, through terror and violence, former Confederates toppled Reconstruction governments. With power in hand, they resurrected white supremacy and suppressed black voting. The Supreme Court could have been an obstacle to these efforts to reimpose the conditions of slavery, but it took a narrow view of the Reconstruction Amendments, including the 15th. It allowed the white South to build impossibly high barriers to black voting, using the exact tools anticipated by proponents of a more extensive right to vote. In 1890, Congress attempted to pass a law for federal supervision of congressional elections. However, Fawner, Eric Fawner, notes it fell victim to Republican infighting and a Southern filibuster in the Senate. As the new century dawned, voting rights for most African Americans were dead, killed by white hostility in the South and white indifference in the North. But this wasn't inevitable. The Wilson Amendment, so the amendment I read a moment ago, nearly became the 15th Amendment, and in that world, there might have been more energy for black rights, for voting rights writ large. In the face of Southern intransigence, America would have had, would not have had to wait until the 1960s to fully exercise their right to the franchise. We would still have anti-voting reactionaries, but they would have had to work harder to make their ideas a reality. Bowie concludes, there's a chance I'm thinking too small. An America that guarantees the right to vote and hold office for blacks and immigrants in 1870 develops very differently from the one that doesn't. Women's suffrage might have come quicker. The idea of using government to ameliorate economic divides might have caught on earlier. The inequality of the Gilded Age might have been tamed before it ran out of control. No matter how unpopular it is, no matter what it costs, no matter whether it brings victory or defeat, it's our duty to hope on and struggle on and work on until we make the humblest citizen of the United States the peer and equal in rights and privileges of every other citizen of the United States, Senator Wilson declared in defense of his amendment. There's always reaction. There will always be backlash. But imagine if 150 years ago we had taken a longer step toward universal suffrage. It might have put us closer to, as Wilson put it, the complete triumph of equality and justice, or at least a lot closer than we are now. Uh, again, this is, this is uh, Jamel Bowie um, commemorating the 150th anniversary of the 15th Amendment, uh, which we are going to talk a bit about here uh, for the rest of our session. So Grant's inaugurated March 1869. Um, Congress will approve, the 15th will be ratified, uh, and, and it extends the votes for Blacks in the North and the South. The Reconstruction Amendments were only obviously focused on the South. Interestingly, the passage of the 15th will fracture the women's suffrage movement. Uh, the Women's uh, National Suffrage Association, led by Katie Stanton and Anthony, uh, will split from the American Women's Suffrage Association, uh, which was um, uh, supported by Frederick Douglass. Douglass made an appeal during this time 
to Stanton and um, Anthony uh, to, to support uh, the enf enfranchisement of black men, recognizing that nobody was talking about prepared to extend the franchise to women. Uh, that created a rift between Douglas and the, um, the, the, the Stanton and uh, that, that other crowd. Um, so uh, let's see, there is one, this, this clip, we've talked about 13th, 14th, 15th amendments and their importance. Uh, let me just share this clip uh, from the Khan Academy. I hope you're familiar with, uh, with this resource. Um, it's a discussion by um, Walter Isaacson, uh, uh, historian, Tulane professor, uh, commentator we've all seen often, and Jeffrey Rosen from the National Constitution Center. They have just completed a study uh, for Khan Academy students on the three amendments and um, they do a good summary here. Of I'm Walter Isaacson of the Aspen Institute, and we're here with our third lesson on the Reconstruction Amendments. Uh, and I'm with Jeffrey Rosen, the CEO of the National Constitution Center in Philadelphia. So now we get to the 15th Amendment. First, let's put it on the timeline. When did it happen? Passed by Congress February 26, 1869, and ratified February 3rd, 1870. And we call these the Reconstruction Amendments, but let's get the whole timeline straight. Reconstruction basically begins ends with the end of the Civil War in April 1865 and pretty much ends with the end of Ulysses S. Grant's presidency at the beginning of 1877 when Rutherford Hayes takes over. Is that about right? That's exactly right. The Compromise of 1876, which gives Hayes the presidency and the deal is that the Southern Democrats agreed to support Hayes in exchange for the end of Reconstruction. So Reconstruction was a big, broad thing that helped change the way the laws were applied in the South. But at the core were these three amendments, right? They are the uh, mark that was left in the Constitution, constitutionalizing the vision of the Reconstruction Republicans. So let's get to the 15th. What does it say? It says, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude. In other words, freed slaves could vote. In theory. So, uh, why, well, first of all, why was it necessary? Wasn't that an obvious thing? It was necessary because the 14th Amendment, which we talked about last time, only protected civil rights, not political rights. This was a distinction that was important to the Reconstruction Republicans. They thought that although a citizen of Maryland could go to Virginia and make contracts, the same Maryland citizen couldn't go to Virginia and vote in Virginia elections or on Virginia juries. And therefore, all Section 2 of the 14th Amendment also seems to anticipate that southern states might deny African Americans the right to vote, but reduce their apportionment in Congress accordingly. That's why, even though the 14th Amendment guarantees equality of civil rights, it took the 15th Amendment to guarantee equality of the political right of voting. Now, you said in theory it allowed freed slaves to vote. Why just in theory? Because soon after the 15th Amendment was passed, southern states did their darndest to disenfranchise African Americans by ruses and other stratagems. They passed grandfather clauses that prohibited people from voting if they hadn't been registered before the Civil War. They passed poll taxes that made it impossible for African Americans to afford to cast a vote. And the Supreme Court, in a series of decisions, some of them written by liberal heroes like Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, upheld these appalling stratagems. So in practice, African Americans could not meaningfully vote in many Southern states until after the Civil Rights Movement of the 1960s. It really took the Voting Rights Act of 1965 meaningfully to give African Americans the right to vote that they were promised more than a century earlier. Yeah, under what ground did Oliver Wendell Holmes and others sort of overturn what is the clear intent of this amendment? Well, it was, it was an amazing decision. It was called Giles, the Giles decision, and Holmes basically said only formal forms of disenfranchisements are prohibited, prohibited by the amendments. Ruses that have the effect of disenfranchisement aren't covered. And then he said, basically, if the Southerners are perpetrating a fraud on African American citizens, the court can't be a party to the fraud by presuming to strike it down. It was really striking and appalling. And when decision. was that decision? That was soon after, it was in the 1870s, soon, soon after the 15th Amendment. So was pretty passed. much these reconstruct, or at least the 15th Amendment, is undermined or at least made irrelevant within 10 years of passage. 
This was the time of Jim Crow beginning to rise up. It was the time that the court upheld a railroad segregation in Plessy versus Ferguson. It's such a tragic story. It was, it was also a time when the Supreme Court struck down the Civil Rights Act of 1875, which had been passed to guarantee equality in accommodations and access to public places. So you have this shining promise of reconstruction embodied in these amendments, but very quickly, Southern states act to deny the promise with their laws, and the Supreme Court just repeatedly and relentlessly sides with the South and against the intention of the framers of the Reconstruction. So throughout the 1870s, and it's not just the South now, it's the Supreme Court as well, throughout the 1870s, you said Plessy versus Ferguson, that basically says what? That's by 1890, and that says that railroad segregation, where Southern states are compelling railroad carriages to separate blacks and whites, is perfectly consistent with the uh, 14th Amendment, that there was a stirring dissent by Justice John Marshall Harlan, saying that the Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. Thurgood Marshall read Harlan's dissent before arguing Brown versus Board of Education, and it wasn't until 1954 that the Supreme Court essentially overturns Plessy and recognizes that segregation is a violation of the 14th Amendment. So from the 1870s to the 1890s, we pretty much have the undermining of at least the 15th Amendment and somewhat the Equal Protection Clause, and it's almost a hundred years how does it happen 100 years later? We have the Voting Rights Act. What else? I suppose it really began after World War II, when African Americans served with whites honorably in the war, and Major League Baseball was integrated, and public opinion about segregation began to change. When the Roosevelt and Truman administrations argued against segregation, and by the time the court struck down school segregation in 1854, repudiating the doctrine of separate but equal, Public opinion was nationally against segregation. 54% of the country opposed segregation in 1954. And explain what the phrase separate but equal, how does that come about? Well, it came about, I suppose, from Plessy versus Ferguson, which recognized that you couldn't have completely unequal railroad carriages or facilities, but said it was fine to separate blacks and whites, because if anyone assumed that there was any intention to degrade African Americans, that was just their construction. You know, as long as the railroad carriages were basically the same, then there was no inequality. Brown versus Board of Education repudiated that unconvincing ruse and recognized that both the purpose and effect of segregation was to stigmatize and degrade African Americans as inferior and less worthy than whites. And so what we have are these three Reconstruction Amendments passed between 1865 and 1870, and they really come into full force exactly a century later with the 1965 Voting Rights Act and the other Civil Rights Acts of the 1960s. Is that about right? That's exactly right, and that reminds us that any notion we have that our rights come mostly from the Supreme Court is not consistent with history, because although we fought a civil war and passed these three heroic constitutional amendments, it wasn't until the people of the United States rose up in the civil rights movement to actually make these rights a reality. Thank you, Jeffrey Rosen. Thank you. What I like about this, this clip, obviously it does a, a marvelous job of, of uh, summarizing the, the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendment, placing them in uh, context, but it also gives us a very short uh, history of what will be the next hundred years in, in the area of uh, civil rights, uh, the Supreme Court's interpretations, uh, and, and, and in too many instances, their, their denigration, unfortunately, of uh, what, what Congress intended. Uh, we, we learn in the era of the writing of these amendments, clearly the radical Republicans intended uh, that, that freedmen, free and freed men, would, would have these rights so enumerated, and, and over the next hundred years, uh, the courts would um, interpret those rights away, and it would take until uh, the Civil Rights Acts of uh, 64, 65, and 68 uh, to 1964, 5, and 8 uh, to bring reality to that. But we're still yet today, as we face our election this year, struggling with a uh, voting process that we don't have great confidence in. Uh, going back again to that debate over do we have a positive uh, right to vote in the 15th Amendment. But, but let me move on quickly. Uh, so as, as, as Eric Foner says, our, our second founding, which again he calls this uh, 13, 14, 15, uh, uh, is, has now been complete. 
but as, as uh, Isaacson and Rosen said, uh, very quickly eroded again by the machinations of the southern governments in the south that will ascend over the next few generations to destroy all that that second founding intended. Also the violence as we we started out this morning saying looking at Memphis and New Orleans was would be unabated. The Ku Klux Klan uh, has and, and, and groups like the Ku Klux Klan. We need to be careful to understand that uh, the Klan uh, is, isn't a monolith. The Klan is certainly a unique organization, but there are many small uh, anti-black, white supremacist, local and statewide organizations of so-called uh, good white citizens arming themselves at night, terrorizing black communities all across the South. And this terror would continue and that the U.S. government is then again challenged with this, uh, this, this question, what is your responsibility? They will meet that or answer that challenge with the force acts. Uh, three uh, pieces of uh, Reconstruction era legislation, uh, the first in 1870, uh, maybe the most uh, important, uh, protecting the right to vote, creating a system to penalize state officials uh, who were discriminating, preventing blacks from voting, uh, providing penalties uh, for any individuals who would use force or intimidation, blocking the exercise of the freedmen's rights. And in this, this passage, penalize any two people who use disguise, an obvious direct challenge to those folks who disguise themselves in the night, ride through the community and wreak havoc and murder and terror. Uh, federalization of the uh, federal uh, authorities in, in the states and, and granting special jurisdiction to the federal courts. Um, uh, the concept of diversity jurisdiction that all law students and lawyers know arises out of this, this group of, of statutes. Um, interestingly, we, we, we talked early on about the different oaths that former Confederates would have to take. Would it, would it be the oath of loyalty, uh, which essentially says, I promise to be true in the future, or did you have to take this ironclad oath, which is what the radical Republicans uh, wanted uh, to challenge Johnson's uh, easier path back to citizenship. So jurors who would be called uh, in cases brought under these enforcement acts would have to take the ironclad oath. Uh, the, the oath would say, um, yes, I, I, I'm going to tell the truth. Yes, I'm loyal to the U.S. government. And no, I have never provided support of any kind uh, to the Confederacy. Uh, I, I thought that was, was, was particularly interesting, recognizing that if you're going to actually have a, a, a jury trial, uh, the, the people sitting on that jury uh, have to understand how important it is uh, and, and what they're doing, and, and if they're biased, uh, this would have eliminated, ostensibly would have eliminated them. Um, again, this is the first of, again, the force acts. The second was really directed at uh, Republican challenges to uh, what they believed were, they called democratic irregularities, that was vote fraud. It was corruption in, in the North, and, and so less to do with what was going on in the South. And the last was the Ku Klux Klan Act. So having passed the first act, realizing that it was only so effective and that the real enemy here was the Ku Klux Klan, they criminalized conspiracies uh, by, again, groups of hooded vigilantes. And, and they do actually for a period of time, uh, certainly through the next five years when the army stays in the South, uh, suppress some of the violence by the Klan formally. And, and again, some of the testimony uh, given at these Klan hearings in Congress exist today, are available to historians and, and tell a, a um, horrifying story of, of the murder, the rape, uh, the destruction of black bodies and communities during this time. Okay, Marion, let's um, see if we've got a couple of more questions before we head to our close today. 
Linda, Lois. Okay, just a second. I'll start reading. There are quite a few. <laughs> Pick a couple. <laughs> okay. Um, one question was, David, was Du Bois uh, basic frustration was that the USA had never recognized that racism drove capitalism and continued to do so? This is Bruce Ballard. Re re read that again, Marion. I missed the middle part. Okay. Uh, was, yes. I'm sorry. Was Du Bois' basic frustration okay. that the USA had never recognized that racism drove capitalism and continued to do so? Was that a basic frustration for Du Bois? I, I think so. I, I think if I understand the, the question, uh, and, and Bruce, we can dialogue afterwards because I don't want to miss it. But but yes, I think that's uh, you know he was was not a uh, a socialist early in his career. Uh, he was a a ardent uh, believer in the potential of uh, uh, the the Constitution of uh, the the opportunity for. Uh, black men and women to educate themselves, to, to uh, ascend, uh, to uh, increasingly higher uh, positions within the society. Uh, but over time, and, and as he again lived this, uh, you remember he born two, three years after the Civil War. And, and so as a, as a young man, uh, he would have seen uh, much of what we've been talking about, and certainly as an older man, as he became increasingly active in uh, the, the, the politics and in the, the equality movements of the day, uh, would have be become uh, frustrated with uh, his efforts and the efforts of other Black folks simply to stop lynching, simply to get the government to recognize their responsibility to, to protect the lives, the property, uh, the, the, the futures of Black Americans. And, and he was critical always that, that, that capital uh, was not playing its part, indeed was a co-conspirator in continuing the oppression of poor people, particularly poor Black people, because early on, we got to get the South growing again. We got to get cotton back into the market. And, and they were prepared to do whatever and, and were, were again complicit in the terrible things that were done to force black people back to the farms and that would have would have supported Johnson's uh, reneged promises of land for, for black people. Again, we, we get back into this, this issue of inequality again. And, and that's what, what drove uh, uh, Du Bois ultimately to renounce his citizenship, to become a member of the Communist Party and to um, expatriate to Ghana, where he would die uh, a, a Ghanaian citizen, I believe three or four days before the March on Washington. So a, a life that, that is, is incredible in so many ways, but, and that's a long answer to Bruce's question. Uh, Marianne, one more. Okay, uh, another was, was Grant elected primarily as a reaction to Southern intransigence and Andrew Johnson's failure to ensure the rights of Blacks in the South? I think we can certainly say that Grant's election was a repudiation of, of Johnson. And remember who was voting at the time, right? Uh, most of the votes were coming from the North because the Southern states had, had um, lost their rights by uh, how they had try to return the South to slavery. Uh, and so, yes, uh, the midterms of 1866, the election of 1868 was a, um, a referendum uh, by voters that they liked what the radical Republicans were proposing, that Grant represented, obviously the party, he was the standard bearer, and that they were prepared to follow the radical Republicans down that path to ensuring uh, right for the black man and protection of their, those constitutional rights. And I have one more that's related to this section. Okay. And then we'll, we can move on, but uh, it's from James Stewart. Uh, David, please mention the panic of 1873 as a factor weakening, weakening Northern support for reconstruction. 
Excellent. I will, Jim, and I'll 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 point it more directly point to it more directly next week. But uh, as I said, uh, Grant begins his uh, term with with strong support. The the Re Republicans uh, uh, win by a landslide, and they're able to establish their their agenda. Uh, a panic. Uh, uh, Economic downturn, 1873, will give the Democrats a new opening, as, as often happens. Uh, the, the country goes into a, a deep recession, and uh, public opinion swings radically toward the Democrats. And in the next election, uh, the Democrats will uh, take a majority of the House and the Senate for the first time since uh, well before the Civil War and Grant will lose, uh, obviously, the, the um, uh, Congress uh, and, and will struggle for the rest of his second term uh, to, to really pass uh, any significant uh, legislation and, and will ultimately um, uh, fail, in, in my view, in the Republican Party support for uh, free and freed Black people in the South. We will look at that very, very closely over the next two Saturdays. But yes, Jim, that was a pivotal moment as, as economic downturns often are in, in where public opinion goes. And the Republicans lost uh, the support uh, because people lost their jobs, couldn't feed their families. And, and as often, uh, that, that uh, has a strong influence on their support for the party in power, which was Grant's. Okay, let's uh, take a couple of more minutes. I, I want to just introduce uh, next week, and, and I do it again by showing you one of my, my favorite um, <laughs> images again from, from this era. I hope you recognize some of these names. Uh, you will, over the next couple of weeks, a uh, point on my far left, Hiram Revels. We've mentioned his name a couple of times, would be uh, one of two black senators who will sit in the U.S. Senate during this time. And on my far right is, is perhaps my uh, hero of this era, Robert B. Elliott. Not because he was, simply because he was a lawyer, but because uh, he will be the gentleman uh, and, and we will try to present his, his speech uh, in the U.S. Congress um, where he's defending uh, the Civil Rights Act of, 18, um, of 1875 uh, in debate against Alexander Stevens from the uh, former uh, VP of the Confederacy. But uh, just a, a teaser uh, of, of uh, what we're going to see next week. Elliot, born in the UK, educated at Eton College in their law school, and he immigrates to the US after service in the Royal Navy. He's admitted to practice law in South Carolina. Not, I don't believe the first uh, black man admitted to practice, but probably the first black Brit. Um, and, and he's ultimately, in addition to his political service, he is appointed an adjutant general in the South Carolina National Guard. Um, just a, a uh, thoroughly interesting life and tragically a short-lived life. Du Bois mentions him specifically as he as he catalogs the lives of each of these, uh, particularly the congressmen, the senators, the governors, and, and, and reports in his telling of the Robert Elliott story, how tragic it was to the black leadership at the time that he dies at the age of 41 from malaria. It would have gone on to be a giant in the history of our race, I believe. Uh, he's a giant in, in my mind, even dying as a young man. You saw this image from uh, the video clip, uh, just a, a, a quick, uh, so this is, this is essentially a view of the con former Confederate states, and you see this array of uh, black congressmen who uh, we will examine more closely next week. But um, um, some, some interesting stories there, and you also saw this uh, clip showing uh, sort of the total number, uh, estimated to be upwards of 2,000. Again, this, as Foner said, was not black rule or black supremacy. Uh, this was a minority of the elected officials in the states uh, at, at this time. 
but but as uh, I believe David Blight said, was certainly a revolution. Who could have imagined five years before this or at any time before this that you'd be seeing so soon after the, the Civil War, black men sitting in office, again, at every level, uh, looking for ways to create, to rebuild, to reconstruct the South. Okay, um, I'm going to take just a few minutes. Uh, everyone has heard bits and pieces of the um, Frederick Douglass oration, maybe his, his most famous, and I'd love to play it all for you, but um, I know I would lose you all, so I'm not going to do that. Let me play some selected portions for you, hopefully. And what? Let's, I'm sorry. To the American slave is your... Let me stop. Marion, let's stop recording because this is this YouTube that uh, 